today we're going to talk about dementia with people who are later uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's or later onset. Thank you for joining us again, Dr. Sabika. Hello. Thanks for having me. It's a Great. pleasure to be here. Uh, so when we get started, I'd love to just kind of set a little, uh, set the context for who we're going to be talking about and specifically what we're going to be talking about. We've talked a lot about cognitive issues um, and dementia and people diagnosed young onset. But today we're going to be talking about people that have been diagnosed with Parkinson's later in life. And Dr. Sabika, correct me if I'm wrong, would we say maybe that's around 60 and later, maybe? Yes, absolutely. That is always a, a very important uh, you know, question. What we talk about when we say young versus late. I would say late onset or quote, quote, or regular onset of Parkinson's disease it's fair to say 65 to 70, that is what the data are pointing us for the most part around that age group between 65 and 70 in terms of motor symptoms. So onset of tremor, onset of rigidity, onset of stiffness, onset of falls around okay. that time, I would say. Great. And so if you uh, have not had a chance to watch our other webinars, maybe you were diagnosed earlier. One of the things that we've talked about with Dr. Savika is when you're diagnosed younger, let's say, you know, under 60, uh, under 55, that disease actually is quite different. So it's it'd be great for you to go back and watch those webinars. And Lee will put up the links so that you can check those out because uh, we might be talking about things a little bit differently today. Uh, so let's say that we're talking for, for the purposes of discussion today, well, let's do it sort of as a case study. So we're talking about somebody around 70 years old. Uh, they've been diagnosed with Parkinson's. They did uh, sort of notice it with onset motor symptoms, even if they might look back and say, I experienced some other things, right? Uh, but th that's going to be the general person that we're talking about. So um, one more question before we get going, would that, would we be talking about dementia, cognition, any of those things differently if it was a male or a female, or is it pretty much the same? So I would say scientific, so if you talk about uh, academic and science, we can, we can think we should, and we have to, and hopefully even in the clinic, we will think differently between men and women. Uh, as we know, men and women have different characteristics. Uh, and we are, we are talking about really sexual chromosomes. So X and X and X and Y, because this is what we know yet about. I cannot talk yet about gender identification. That is, we don't have the data yet to support right. any difference there. So when we talk men and women, we are talking about X and X, X and Y situation. And it's true. In, the, in, the, in our world, there is a substantial difference between men and women in terms of frequency, uh, in terms of occurrence of, um, I would say more cortical, more higher brain function complication in Parkinson's disease and also in Alzheimer's disease. In the recent past, for example, we were thinking and the data were supporting that women were way more affected of Alzheimer's disease compared to men, but nowadays the current studies are making men and women more or less even in terms of distribution. Um, whereas in Parkinson's disease, we know that Parkinson's disease is greatly uh, more affecting men compared to women to start with. But what we observe in uh, memory disorder, we observe the same thing that we observe as we get older in Parkinson's disease. The two curves are diverging, so in other words, Men and women are different at 65, 70. But uh, as women and women are getting older, the two curves are, are getting back together. This is valid also for, for dementia, memory loss. They diverge and then as people are getting older in their 80s and 90s, there seem to be some sort of similarities between the, the frequency of this condition. Men and women are different scientifically, uh, biologically, so clearly we have to think about different way that the disease develops scientifically. Clinically, we don't have yet this translation that can make us think in a such a different way. Not yet, but the data are mounting. So I wouldn't be surprised if in the last, in the next two, three, four years, we will have more data to support, uh, you know, uh, one versus the other um, in terms of even treatment or 
uh, in terms of a prognosis per se. Okay, that's great. So for the audience listening, you can assume that we are, we're sort of talking about how they present clinically in the office. Uh, we're talking about people that are 70 and older. And um, if you have a specific question, please put it in the chat. Let us know, you know, hey, I'm a woman and I have was diagnosed in su such and such a time. Maybe there will be something different. Maybe Dr. Savika will point out something that would differentiate the, the situation. Um, so, uh, but we'll, we'll kind of go along with that. So we hear a lot of terms in the world of Parkinson's symptoms, such as cognitive decline, mild cognitive impairment, dementia. Can you define those three terms for us and let us know how they're different? Absolutely. That is, uh, so terminology, getting the right terms of a condition, and we know it's crucial to identify, to identify exactly what we're talking about. So let's start, let's start from the latter, the last, the last one you say. So myocranial impairment and dementia, what are they? Those are clinical symptoms, you know, the clinical syndrome. So syndrome is a combination of signs and symptoms that define a disease. Mild cognitive impairment is a memory loss that the patient perceives family around the patients is, are perceiving as well, that is not significantly interfering the daily life activities. Means in other words, the patient is struggling with uh, some memory loss that is able, he or she is able to overcome in the long run. In other words, let's say problems with finding direction, but ultimately you're making your way problems of cooking, but maybe rather than taking 10 minutes to do a, whatever dish you do in 10 minutes, I don't know, uh, uh, you make 25 minutes and maybe you make some mistakes along the line, but you correct yourself. Those, this is a good example of so mild cognitive impairment. Dementia, on the other hand, is a group of signs of symptoms, but in this case, it's a memory problem that um, it is not, may or may, may be or may not be perceived by the patient, is perceived by the family, for sure, and by the caregivers, that is significantly interfering with daily life activities. So in other words, the patient doesn't have a, a clear um, insight of the problem, but uh, the patient is not able to cook, is not able to drive, is not able to function without assistance throughout the day. Clearly, this is a spectrum. So in other words, usually when somebody is having myocardial impairment that for now on, I will call MCI. So myocardial impairment, MCI, there's a spectrum. So sometimes I tend to call things moderate cognitive impairment just because it's not quite into the dementia diagnosis, but it's not quite in the MCI. So it's a spectrum condition that depends on how the memory disease, the memory problem is interfering with daily life activities. And this has to do with our society. What I mean is that if our society wouldn't require us, I give you an example, very, very silly example, driving cars. And there was a self-driving car mechanism as we will have maybe in the future. Maybe many people would not feel that they have MCI because they say, I need to go to the grocery, press button, the car brings you there. That would be a way to reduce the number of people with a clinical symptom of MCI because you don't have the task that you need to be doing and the society is requiring you to be doing. The other term to use is cognitive decline, cognitive loss. In the past, we talk about brain fog. All these are synonyms basically of some difficulties. And in case of Parkinson's disease, most of the time, especially in young onset, but also in late onset, we're talking about people that are talking I feel I am slow. I feel I'm slow mentally, not only physically. I feel I have trouble going A to A, point A, point B, even mentally, not physically only. I feel I have trouble multitasking. So rather than doing three things at the same time, I have to do one because if I do two, then I got lost. Those are examples of memory loss. Those are what we call cognitive decline. But we know we have to try to assimilate, put together the concept of cognitive decline with concept of aging. As we get older, 
we lose brain. After the age of 25, unfortunately, the brain shrinks down. So as we get older, we lose brain. We are losing brain. And as we get older and older, together we, and this is an important concept for our conversation today, together with a brain that is lost naturally, we naturally accumulate plaques and tangles that are the same plaques and tangles that we will see in people that have Alzheimer's disease. So as we get older, people that are in their late 80s, early 80s, early 90s, if I look at the brain, I may see some plaque and plaques and tangles, whether or not they do have a clinical diagnosis of dementia, whether or not patient has a clinical diagnosis of MCI as part of the aging process that our brain is undergoing. Okay, so this is an important concept that differentiate young onsets versus late onset. Because in young onset, we do not have, we shouldn't have this accumulation of additional protein that can damage the brain. Whereas when we are getting older, the age is something that we cannot control and we will lose memory um, sooner or later. Somebody can argue, hey, my, uh, Dr. Saviga, my, myself or my grandfather lived 97 and he lived great. Great, <laughs> it's fantastic <laughs> and, and, and it's good. Uh, but many, many of the memory problems depends on the societal demand, demand that we need, the task that we need to be doing. And also depends on some people are genetically and uh, are able to sustain a longer longevity without having massive damage to the brain, I would say. Okay, great. So that brings up several questions. First one is, do we have any uh, data or that we can say with certainty, the percentage of people later onset diagnosis of Parkinson's yep. that they get dementia? Sure. That is uh, that has been uh, one of the. If you look the literature and you put down dementia, memory loss, Parkinson's disease, you will find everything. Um, I can quote you literature that says five percent people are getting dementia in Parkinson's disease late onset, or ninety five percent. So it goes the entire spectrum, and has to do a lot with a couple of things. It has to do on when things are seen how long after the diagnosis has been seen, um, age has to be in consideration, has to be always adjusted. I tell you, I, I will report the data that we generated here in Rochester using our epidemiological data that I think are in line with other data. So we are not giving anything out of the ordinary. In about 10 years from the diagnosis of late onset Parkinson's disease, so 70 to 80, about 39%, of patient may have some memory problem. I didn't say dementia. I say some memory problem. So I have patients that uh, I have some that will have uh, MCI, my cognitive impairment, some that would have dementia, some of them would have uh, the report this slowness that sometimes happens in Parkinson's disease. But I um, I have to tell you something that is very important, very, very important. Other things need to be considered whenever somebody gets a clinical diagnosis of dementia male cognitive impairment. Later onset or younger onset, but we're talking about later onset today. Remember, the diagnosis of dementia is clinical. So in other words, it's based upon the report of the patient, of the caregiver, caretaker, of a substantial, significant memory loss. That is affecting, and I told this last time, but I want to do this again one more time, four domains of memory. This is what neuropsychologically we consider. Working memory with this short-term memory loss, a phone number I'm not able to recall, a name I'm not able to recall, short-term memory, so what is called the working memory. Visual spatial memory, my ability to see myself in space, my ability to see three-dimensional tri images, Language, some memory disorder, uh, we consider memory disorder is just language. People are having problems with speaking, producing words, pronouncing words, understanding the words. And the fourth one is called executive function, the ability to plan things in a very precise way. If somebody is having a massive decline or one of these, just one of these, 
this can be a dementia symptom. The, depends, depends on how this is interfering with daily life activities of somebody. If somebody is mute completely because he's not able to pronounce, to enunciate, this is in, they can have intact memory, intact working memory, intact executive function, but they may con be considered what? Demented, just because one of the domain is down. So once we have this down, I have one of the four domain down, I have potentially have dementia, I have to make sure that there's nothing else that can contribute to that. Especially as we get older, there are th even younger, but older, there are other things that we need to be considered. And I need to tell you this because this is, has to do with our well being. Number one, easy sleep disorder. If we don't sleep well at night, if we snore, snoring is something that is so much overlooked. But people that have my, even mild sleep apnea in their 70s and 80s, they may not have sleep apnea when they stop the breathing, right? And they gasp for hair. But the oxygen level may be slow enough for many years enough that can worsen the memory. It can be maybe one of the things that we need to treat immediately whenever somebody reports memory problems. So what I do in the office, I have my patient in front of me, I ask the spouse, does your husband, does your wife snore? If the answer is yes, I usually say, okay, let's do a screen. Let's make sure your oxygen level is too low. Because if it's too low, we have to fix it. And doesn't need to be fixed with a CPAP. Sometimes other things can be done for that. Another thing, since she's still talking about sleep disorder, leaving out the dreams. Dream and acrim behavior disorder is incredibly common in late onset Parkinson disease. In other words, the thrashing at night this is disrupting the quality of the night's sleep. So it's very important to fix it and to improve this. And this can be improved with medications. I would say in the vast majority of the patient, not in all the patients, but that is another part of sleep disruption that needs to be fixed. Another overlooked thing that I want everybody here listening to that can contribute to memory is late onset anxiety and depression. These need to be fixed. Clearly, we are dealing with somebody that has Parkinson's disease, maybe a newly diagnosed, maybe a few years have passed. Maybe our, my patient in front of me uh, just retired. So there's not only a major life adjustment, which is retirement, but already a diagnosis that still carries a lot of social stigma. Everybody would be a little bit down. And if depression and anxiety and or anxiety are not treated, Sometimes they do not make patient crying or being hopeless or having somatic symptoms of the depression, but can be just, quote, quote, a memory issues. When people are fatiguing, are, you know, thinking, take longer to think. So this has to be fixed. So sleep disorder, mood disorder needs to be immediately fixed and any other concomitant condition. I'll give you an example. Fibromyalgia, that is something that if it's concomitant can worsen memory at any age. But if you have Parkinson's disease and you may be having a little bit of macronic impairment, then your symptoms can be looking worse just because you haven't treated that particular core part. So those are things that seem to be uh, silly, seem to be clear to anyone, but in reality, they very, very often overlooked by that, okay? So those are things that I would consider when I see, when I had a patient in front of me. Another one, fourth, medications. Concomitant medication used for different purpose. I give you an example. Many of our older gentlemen and gentle lady are suffering over, of overactive bladder. And sometimes some of the medication used for the overactive bladder, they can worse in memory, especially if somebody is having already Parkinson's disease. So usually I, generally speaking, use just two medication just to make sure that I don't have anything that is affecting the brain. And that is very important to do because that can be another thing that can contribute and worsen the memory. Assuming that all these four aspects, medication, sleep, concomitant conditions such as pain, and mood disorders 
have been fixed. How? With medications, with lifestyle changes, with acceptance, with change, many different changes. Then you say, okay, you still have memory problems. Okay, what can we do? What kind of memory problems we are dealing with? Is it Parkinson that is getting worse? Is the protein of Parkinson, the so-called alpha synuclein, Lewy bodies when accumulate, spreading through the cortex, causing the memory, or there's a concomitant, a concurrent presence of aging, a beta amyloid, the protein of Alzheimer, that combine together, causing the memory. Can I know that? Yes, I can find a way to know that. I, in front of my patient, see I was in front of me in my office, I would say, you know what, let's order some tests. Let's order some scans of the brain. Why? Because uh, if you do, if you do have a degeneration similar to Alzheimer's disease, I'm expecting to see some areas, specific areas of the brain, shrinking down. If there was only Parkinson's disease, only quote quote Parkinson's disease, I wouldn't see this massive shrinkage. Maybe I would order then a PET scan of the brain. The PET scan will provide me more information. So remember, MRI is a structural scan, show you the bricks of the house. PET scan is showing the plumbing of the house. If you want to buy a house, you want to know both. Uh, so it's is the same brain, but gives you other information. But PET scan can give, tell me, okay, we are dealing not only with Parkinson, but maybe the pattern or the change can be seen in Alzheimer's. So maybe this gentleman or gentle lady now is 75, 78, as maybe both. Why this is important? Mostly for prognostic factors and mostly to be more or less aggressive regarding medication and what we can do. Somebody posted, which is a very good question, was what about Lewy body disease? What's the difference? Well, the difference is nomenclature. It's just a matter of finding the name. So we know the Lewy bodies is the, are the, is the hallmark of Parkinson disease and the hallmark of uh, Lewy body disease. If I look at the brain, when people are dead, they have the same appearance The Lewy bodies accumulates. The problem is that Lewy body disease, the memory problem occurs within one year from the onset of Parkinson's disease and vice versa. So somebody has memory problems within one year, they do have motor problems like Parkinson's disease. This is the definition. So the memory disorder occurs early in the course of the disease. Whereas when we talk about Parkinson's disease, dementia usually is above one, maybe two years, I would say, stretching the concept. It's something that is happening later on in life, okay, in the course of the disease. This is the main difference. But the treatment is more or less similar. It's okay. a matter of knowing the prognosis. So I have in front of me a patient. Can I order spinal fluid analysis? I can. I can order the spinal tap and get a little bit more detailed information regarding the protein accumulation of Alzheimer. Can I order beta amyloid scan? I can, it's very expensive, sometimes add something, sometimes it doesn't add something. But clearly depends on this individual patient and what we are searching for and how much things are clear. And after that, we need to make sure that we are taking care of the symptoms. So memory disorders, see what we can do, what we can do. Again, I'm assuming depression, sleep disorder, no medications, other conditions are under control. Clearly, we need to optimize, first of all, we need to optimize the Parkinson treatment. Mm -hmm. So carbidopa, levodopa, let's say, the gold standard need to be at the optimal level because a suboptimal level of carbidopa, levodopa can cause also slowing of the brain. So not right. slowing on the motor part, but also slowing of thinking. So first thing first, let's make sure that we are taking the right amount of medication, the maximum tolerated one, the one that we can optimize. If it's not enough, 
then we can add a medication to try to boost up the memory. Usually, unfortunately, we do not have a lot of them. We have, most of them are called anticholinesterase inhibitors. So the typical one are donepezil, rivastigmine, memantine later on uh, in a second phase. So we will use that to try to boost up the memory. And in some cases it works. Sometimes whether with that, I have to add an antidepressant, not because of depression, because I'm trying to sustain the chemical in a different way. So not all the antidepressants are used for depression, but also sometimes to sustain the biochemical reduction of, the, of some of the neurotransmitters that are present in Parkinson's disease with memory disorder. And then I would say to the patient, let's see how you're doing. Let's observe you because one point in time is not good. We had to have at least another point in time, a few months, so up to a year later. Is a big deal, is a big deal, because that can define the progression of the disease. That right. can tell me when we are heading. There are other symptoms, and somebody just posted hallucinations. What about hallucinations? Are they a signal of uh, dementing illness, it depends. Are they a signal of dementia bodies? Can be, unless there's an explanation. Right. Most of the time hallucinations are because uh, people are taking medication. Okay. Or, okay. So we have to assume that there's nothing else causing this problem. Then yes, hallucinations can be one of the cr clinical characteristic for dementia Lewy bodies, but we have to make sure there's nothing else causing this problem. So hallucinations, is a good sign to look to make the diagnosis, but it's incomplete. We have to make sure there's some that is the only symptom without something else. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that it brings up several different things. We, yeah, we will get to these questions. Absolutely, they are uh, great. Some of them are fantastic. Yeah, they are. They're really great. Um, but what it really brought up for me, you're you're explaining everything and you're talking about all the different things that could impact cognition. Uh, is that, and this is something that we see on our side is, you know, people will start to feel it or their care partner will start to notice it and they get very scared, right? And they think, okay, this, this happens, they're going to be, they're going to have full-blown dementia. And uh, so I think that, that if you're out there listening and you're wondering, this is, this is great news. And this is a, this is a good sign to kind of take a breath and say, okay, let, let's hold on here. Let's not, assume that because I forgot where the grocery store was that I'm going to be completely, you know, have dementia. I'm not going to be able to do my life is, but the key is to find somebody who can treat you and is as skilled as Dr. Savika and being able to look at all of those different things, look at your sleep, look at your depression, look at your mood, all of those different things before you, you know, take on that big thing, like, oh, this is all over. So I think that's a critical, critical piece to to notice. And if you like, for example, if right now, if you're seeing a primary care doctor and this person doesn't have all of that information, this is a great time to see, do they have anybody they can refer you to? Is there anybody within driving distance? Is there anybody you can see by a telemedicine? Perfect. Somebody who actually has the very specific skill to be able to address all of these different issues is super important. So I want to make sure that we get that. Um, somebody, I want to address this question because it was, you were just talking about it, but somebody said, okay, so if I have no memory issues in year one after diagnosis, this means no LBD in my future. Well, what can we let's say to that? talk about something that is important. So remember, if I open up the brain, I see the Lewy bodies, whether somebody is having Parkinson or dementia Lewy bodies, because this is the hallmark. Um, the answer is that uh, more, the more time, I would say easier to say that, the more time you spend into the disease, the more years pass from the original, from the original onset of symptoms, um, is less likely that uh, memory can become an impact, but you're getting older. So we have two offending, offending problem here, Parkinson's disease that will progress and but also time and aging. And the problem is that I cannot anticipate how much your brain would age and how much that can be a problem. So it's possible that your Parkinson process that will develop dementia 
would not be very aggressive, but your aging process would, would be more aggressive. So that is the point. I don't want to say, oh, I, one year has passed, so five years have passed, I'm out of the woods. But five years have passed, you're at now 85. Uh, the onset of uh, dementia start to be more common because you're getting older. So that would be something to consider that aging is something that unfortunately we cannot uh, anticipate very much. Aging of the brain, we cannot know exactly who is developing what and when. You know, that is an important point. So there are two parallel paths, one Parkinson, one aging, plus all the others that I talk about. But these two are the ones that are going parallelly that is tough to anticipate which is going to be what. Okay. Uh, in terms of people getting assessed and people going through testing, you mentioned lots of different tests that you could order. Uh, what role does neuropsychological testing play? Excellent point. So that is good. If we can get a baseline the mom of a neuropsychological assessment, the moment uh, that memory disorders seem to be surfaced is good because this can serve us to understanding what I was talking before. What are the four domains that are involved? And sometimes, you know, it's good to have repeated neuropsychological assessment through time. I have some problems with that in the sense that logistically, it's not easy every time to do this test. Uh, there's a lot of demand. So sometimes you can be months out. So it's not always possible to be doing. Uh, so that's why it's, I, I, not that I don't advocate, I do it all the time, but sometimes it's not easy if you're maybe not having an easy access to a neuropsychologist to get these recurrent tests. But if you can, absolutely, it's good to have the four domain and this can tell us because the symptoms so we have four domains, right? Alzheimer's disease, for example, is a, the domain down is working memory, is really down more than the others. Dementia ray bodies or Parkinson's disease is mostly visual spatial, okay, and executive function. So you will see a different pattern that can tell you what is what, which is important to know. I would say, a, baseline test, whether it's a neuropsychological assessment, if you have access to, or your primary physician, your primary neurologist doing a memory test can already tell us what we are talking about, where we are going with that. So it's good to do it. I strongly support it, but sometimes it's very difficult to have access to that. Yeah. Okay. We also, I, I could be completely wrong to <laughs> suggest this, but I guess if I were uh, diagnosed and I were, you know, if I were living somewhere that I didn't have access to somebody that could do this with me, but I had a care partner or had somebody in my life, you know, what is the, what is the downside of saying, let, let's check it out ourselves. Uh, okay. Let me see, you know, can we create some sort of baseline together where you give me, a, you know, maybe you go for one assessment and you see what that person does. And then six months later, your care partner helps you. I, I just wonder if that's... Oh, no, I, there's nothing wrong with that. Also, I will tell you, there's uh, plenty of uh, decent, uh, valid uh, online tools that you can use uh, to, to, to test memory and to have an idea. Uh, but I always would say that it would be very always very good not to use just a single test. Mm -hmm. uh, this, a single test, whether it's a neuropsychological assessment, whether it's an MRI, cannot be the only test that tells you what's going on. There's to be a part of a bigger picture. There's to be a part of a much more comprehensive overview and needs to be interpreted correctly. Yes. That's the difficult part. There's to be interpreted correctly. Um, I say it's always good and to re-review, re for example, all the MRIs that has been done, to re-review all the PET scan, to re-review the neuropsychological assessment, because uh, sometimes the person that reads, let's say the radiologist that read one test or the neuropsychologist that reads one test, they read that test, but they don't have the rest of the information. So right. uh, that can give them a skewed view. So I'm, I think it's great to do self-assessment, but then the self-assessment should be interpreted maybe by a, a provider in a bigger picture, considering everything else. Because unfortunately, we do not have one single test so far that can tell us with certainty what is happening. Right. 
Um, so some of these tests you indicated that you can see, you know, you, you would expect to see Louis bodies, you, you'll mm -hmm. see them. If, if somebody gets to that stage, is there anything that can be done? Or is this like, no, I mean, this is, you know, this is the issue with Alzheimer's, right? Like there's no getting, coming back from that, right? It's just, it's a progressive thing. It's going to happen uh, versus somebody who's just experiencing sort of maybe mild to moderate cognitive decline. You know, what, what is the path there? Is there, is, is it kind of like, well, there's nothing I can do, but there's something I can do over here. So I tell you something clearly, clearly when the, the menting illness, the menting symptoms are very much advanced, those are difficult to be treated. Uh, then we have to talk about quality of life, we have to talk about goals of care and see what we can do, um, uh, make sure people eat, because as somebody mentioned, but it's true, there's a change in appetite that can occur when, as the progression of the disease is, uh, is occurring, so it's very important to consider that. So being fed, being well, with well rested and so forth. But you're right. I think we need to be proactive. And we need to be proactive with what we have, which is not very much, but is something at least, okay? We need to make sure that when we, even before if possible, but let's say we have, a, I have in front of me the usual patient, 70 year old man or woman with diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, maybe 72, two years of diagnosis, few years of no motor symptoms. Now she or he complains of a little bit of memory problem. What would they do? I would do exactly what I would do in regular late onset Parkinson's disease. We need to be proactive. Exercise, 30 minutes, five times per week. Again, 30 minutes, five times per week of vigorous exercise, something that makes people sweat, perspire, any kind of exercise. If you tell me what is better than the other, doesn't matter, whatever people like. I have people that, that are in the pool, people that are running, people that are biking, doesn't matter. Whatever people like is very boring. You're right at times. So I always say to my patient, you're not allowed to watch TV or watch Netflix unless you put a bike in front of the TV. And every time you turn on TV, you move your legs. That would be a, a, a good way. So exercise, somebody mentioned lifestyle changes, diet, clearly, clearly. We have to prevent the concomitant, the presence at the same time of strokes or cardiovascular diseases. So making sure the diet is, we don't need too much, quote, quote, junk food, not too much food with a lot of fats, not too, so I make sure in other words that my cardiovascular health, cholesterol, diabetes, uh, hypertension is all under good control because this can accelerate the process quite a lot. So diet, do we have any diet for memory? You heard supplements, you heard this, you heard that. I would say, um, there's a number of, fair, of good studies reporting Mediterranean diets, so a diet eaten in the Mediterranean area, Italy, Spain, Lebanon, and so forth, Greece, that seem to be, you know, a little bit better in terms of preventing the condition. But if you go in these countries, you have still dementia, you still have Parkinson. It's not the only thing. But I always recommend to my patients, you know, eat more olive oil, eat more fish. You want to take omega-3, take it. But if you eat fish, fresh fish, you're good. Um, uh, what about flavonoids, uh, little chemicals that are present in what is purple and blue in nature? Yes, please eat more blueberries, eat more raspberries, eat more of these chemicals, that seem, natural chemicals that seem to be helpful. What about curcumin? What about uh, vitamins? You know, I'm very strong in vitamin B12, folate, and B6. And I want all my patients to take that because there's a slight risk or reduction of uh, uh, dementia in Parkinson's disease in patients that are taking vitamin B6, B12, and folate every day. So uh, those are important things that you can do proactively. And one thing I want to tell you, and to me that is very important, more important maybe than the others at times, pleasure. I keep saying, find something that is good for you. Doesn't need to be exotic. If you want, it can be, 
but it doesn't, it doesn't need to be. Strolling with your spouse in the park uh, with the dog, spending time every day reading your favorite book, favorite music, dancing to the sunrise, something that you do that you like and you enjoy has to be incorporated every day. Whether you have Parkinson's disease, whether you have young onset, whether you have late onset with memory loss. Because people that are doing this, all these are the ones that are doing better. I can guarantee that. The people that are active mentally, physically, and socially are the ones that in the long run are having less complications. Whether it's memory, psychosis, problems with medication, problems with cinema, and so forth. Right. Uh, one of the initial questions that we got that I think is super interesting to talk about is it has to do with deep brain stimulation. They yes. talked about, you know, does does uh, any cognitive decline uh, get better with deep brain stimulation? So can you talk a little bit about that's actually an, an issue that maybe you're not the best candidate for it. You talk about age of, of DBS and, sure. and a little bit. And for those people who don't know what what deep brain stimulation is, can you just give a real quick? Absolutely. So this is a great point. Deep brain simulation is uh, basically the, is a technique that is developed in the late 90s, uh, middle to late 90s in France. And basically, uh, this particular uh, technique allows to stimulate with a lead inside the brain, in some structures of the brain, the cells that are responsible, allegedly responsible, to generate some of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So tremor, rigidity, stiffness, and so forth. When is it used? Classically, typically, it's used later on in the disease, so not right away. When people are having what we call fluctuations, in other words, when people are going, taking the medication, they're good for two hours, but then the medication wears off immediately, so they are off then they're on again after the medication in an hour and so forth. So there's this huge fluctuation of response. What this brain simulation does is smoothen up this particular wave to a much more smooth wave with less ups and downs in the response. There are some targets in the brain that are the ones that are targeted whenever we use uh, this uh, technique. It depends on the symptoms of the patient. Some targets are better for tremors, some targets are better for stiffness, some targets are a combination of both. And is a technique that uh, initially was not including, in terms of clinical criteria, people that had memory loss. Because uh, people that have a clear form of dementia, in the beginning also clear form of mild cognitive impairment, they were not included because there was the idea that this could worsen the memory loss. is a technique that can worsen memory loss. Likewise, people that have severe depression usually are not good candidates for the same purpose because initially, and now a little bit less, but still initially, there was some suicidal um, episodes that, was, that were uh, making everybody a little bit more concerned. Nowadays, uh, with somebody that has mild cognitive impairment, uh, we do not worry that much. In other words, it's something that can be still considered as a possible candidate. If there are no other reason why this is the disease, if otherwise a good candidate, but with some memory loss, it can be good. Usually dementia or usual hallucinations, is, those are not the best candidate to be gone there. The question is very specific and it's very important. Does the simulation, can the simulation improve memory? There have been some reports in people with Parkinson's disease that improving the overall motor well being was translating in an improvement of the memory loss or the subjective memory loss that people were having. So we see that. I saw that and we've seen that some improvement of memory after the brain simulation. But this is not what we had to search for. In other words, if it's coming, great, I take it. But it's not something that I'm expecting. Can be, yes, but it depends. Now, if you're talking about age, when to do the deep brain simulation, this is very variable. Deep brain simulation should not be seen as a last resort. It's a treatment 
that can be used at one stage of the disease. But some people are getting to this stage earlier, some people later. The stimulation can be removed, can be literally removed away. And uh, uh, <laughs> it's a different question that is very nice. Uh, but it's not a last resort, it's one treatment, as many others. Right. Somebody is talking about ultrasound. You want me to address that? Uh, in just a second, I want to okay. stay on this one real quickly, Absolutely. just because I'm curious. So a lot of uh, some people experience issues with language after deep brain stimulation. Absolutely. And um, is so uh, I've certainly gotten questions before. Is this a sign that I'm actually having cognitive decline or is it the symptom? And so no, yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? So not necessarily. It's not necessarily you do with the um with the um actually it's not that is that it's not not necessarily at all why with this stimulation is, is in a, the stimulator is in an area that has a lot of pathways including a lot of motor pathways so sometimes once i stimulate i am catching some of the fibers that are responsible for my speech are responsible for my articulation of the mouth so some most of the time changing the parameters, changing the, the voltage, changing the place where the simulator is going will improve the speech. So it's not necessarily meaning, oh, I have a speech disorder, I for sure will have memory loss. There's no this correlation. The speech disorder coming from a simulation usually has to do with the placement of the simulator and the stimulation, the electric current going through that and where it is located, I would say. Okay. So I wouldn't be particularly worried that that would cause a memory disorder. Great. Um, the, this, uh, a couple of people have talked to, us to, to talk to us about like that tip of the tongue situation. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. And I assume that's sort of the language piece of the four, the four pieces. And uh, some people, that's the only thing that they experience. Correct. What, Correct. You know, that's just Correct. sort of, hey, it's just, there's just something blocking that that feeling. That's, and that's to do because the thong, the tongue, for example, has a huge representation in the brain. Think about it, how much we use the tongue every day, all day long. So the muscle representation of the tongue in the brain, in the fibers is very big. So it's the, stimul the simulator can catch some fibers that are, that are involved to that, causing some sometimes numbness right on the tip, sometimes um, lips um, not feeling that you can articulate that well, but it's stimulator dependent. Um, okay, yes, let's talk about the deep brain stimulation that is done by an ultrasound or so focused, ultrasound, focused ultrasound, focused <laughs> ultrasound. Focused yeah. ultrasound. It's yes. not exactly stimulation now in ultrasound. Right. So that is a technique that is relatively old in terms of the theory underlying that, but now it's been adopted and is used in the US, not just in Israel. It's used in the US and all over the world, in, especially in patients that have tremor for the most part. So what is that? is a technique that allows to create a heat. So it's an ultrasound. It's not the same ultrasound we do for the heart or for the pregnancy, no. It's a ultrasound that creates almost a laser, a heat current inside the brain through the skull and cause a damage to the cells. So it's a lesion that is causing the cells. The idea is to target the cell that can cause the tremor because we know more or less where they are. And this can improve the tremor per se. It's not that you go, because I had patients myself that they came to me say, oh, I want to do focal ultrasound, let's do it right now. Snap it, say, no, it's not working this way. We had to do, you had to do the same, um, we had to do the same tests that are done for the selection in deep brain simulation. So the same one. It is a process that requires some preparation, head need to be shaved, you need to be for a few hours still with basically an inverted plate like this full of water to reduce the heat to the head. And there's a little problem that we had to consider. Some people are not possible to be doing that because their skull is too thick. So the thickness of the skull can prevent you to be a candidate. And I'm not kidding about. It depends on the level of the amount of bone that you have, because you remember we had to pass through. Despite there's not any 
scarce because you don't do a you don't do a damage outside you can go straight into the area and you can cause a lesion into the brain is used in this moment fda is still using for one side only so not two sides at the same time so one side only uh, and is an alternative sometimes uh, to the brain simulation but i would say only for the most part not only in patients that have tremor so far because it works better for this group of patients at this point clearly things move in this moment so we don't know when we're going okay um so somebody asked that said that his wife speaks um incoherently and inappropriately like as she's falling asleep is this uh related to cognitive issues dementia no, so the question is that as she's falling asleep she's talking a little bit incoherently not necessarily this is more a, more of a parasomnia so more of a sleep disorder is similar not to the extent of but can be similar to the um rbd it can be similar to dream and act and behavior disorder so it's similar to the trashing out loud but it sometimes we see at the beginning of the of the sleep if you're having a if you're a very fast rem sleeper there are people that are getting into an rem in, within minutes and i think that is what it is i don't think it has to do too much with uh, with uh, with co cognition, especially because it happened only in that window during sleep. Um, all right, we are almost to the top of the hour. If you have any last questions, we've gotten to every one of them, I think. So if you have any last burning questions that you want, Dr. Sadika is right here. Um, is there anything that I should have asked that I didn't that you think is important for our community to know? No, I, I think the questions were great as usual, and I always enjoyed that. Um, my last, my, my final remark is that um, clearly we do not have uh, a cure uh, for Parkinson. We don't have a cure for dementia and Parkinson. But this doesn't mean that we have to be still. We have to be proactive. We have to do everything we can in, in, in our power, not only to be proactive, but also to try to find ways alternative alternative ways to try to halt or delay the progression of the disease so i always say and you guys are doing great on that everybody should be lobbying everybody should try to uh, help the governments and the agencies to provide more research because this is something that we are seeing i want to tell you this not to scare you but we will see a triplication you hear me right triplication on the number of patients that have Parkinson's disease with dementia in 2050. Why? Because of the age of the population, because people are getting older, and because these diseases, for reasons that are beyond our understanding, are still on the rise. And uh, uh, it's something that is clear. So in other words, we will face this problem as we get older, and it would be better to face now rather than when it's too late. That's what I would say. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you again for being with us today. It's always, I always learn so much from you. We love having you here today. Uh, yeah, everyone said thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate Dr. Savika's breadth of knowledge. Absolutely. This is so great. I want to thank our peak partners again for making this possible Adamus, Amniel, Lundbeck, and Synovian. And if you have any questions, you can always email us at blog at dpf.org and always definitely check our website, dpf.org, to find out about new webinars and events coming up. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye.